Well, again, this evening we're returning to Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to read for you again the same text we read this morning to begin with. Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. Uh, we'll do a bit of review and then we'll, we'll get into um, what we want to look at this evening. So this is what our Lord Jesus Christ tells us in the conclusion of uh, chapter 5. And again, let me just remind you that uh, what I've reminded all of us uh, through each of these things, Jesus here is describing to us how the work of the Holy Spirit will give to us the ability to go beyond what the scribes and Pharisees actually do in these particular areas. He will help us to do what the Lord is calling us to do. We don't have to work this up in our own strength. The Lord will provide that strength, but we do need to look to him for it, and we do need to work with him to actually put these particular things on. So this is what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. If we wanted one word to summarize what the Lord actually calls us to be, it would be that word, to be perfect as he is perfect. And loving our enemies is but one of those perfections that the Lord is working in us and that he calls us uh, to put on. Now, remember this morning uh, we saw Jesus telling us that what God originally intended when he said that we are to love our neighbor. He didn't mean what the Jews thought that he meant, that we're only to love those who love us, that we're only to love those close to us, those who are our friends, those who are basically going to show us love in return, but that we are also to love our enemies. We are to love those who hate us. Now, remember the second point was that Jesus is not saying by this that we need to be able to find something in everybody we see that is lovely and that draws our hearts out toward them. I mean, the people we're called to love may have injured us many times, and humanly speaking, uh, perhaps even to, uh, in, in the eyes of the Lord, they have absolutely no redeeming qualities. I want to use that guardedly because we know they have absolutely no goodness in them. They have nothing of the moral image of God, but they still are men made in his image. But with regard to their moral qualities, there's absolutely nothing redeeming in them. So we're not supposed to find that kind of a person lovely. Rather, the Lord was telling us that we are to purpose in our hearts to do them good, to show them mercy, no matter how they may treat us. And he said that we should do this because that is, in fact, what the Father does. Uh, in a parallel passage in the Sermon on the Plain, Luke 6.35, we're told that God is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Every day the Lord does good to all mankind. And every day they don't thank him and rather hate him in return, and yet the Lord continues to be good to them. Jesus says because we now share the same nature as the Father, because we have the Spirit of God living in us, that is what we will want to do, and that is, as a matter of fact, what we will do. Now, Jesus gave us his nature, among other reasons, so that we can be what he calls us to be. Remember, Jesus said earlier in the sermon that we are to be salt in the world. We are to preserve the world. We are to be those who hold back the sins of others, not encourage them or push them forward in it, just by our presence, by our influence, by our deportment, by our demeanor, by our, our character. We, we don't share in the same things that they do, but rather we try to hold them back from doing things we know that are dishonoring to the Lord. We are to be light in this world, 
to be the sharers of good news. But if we can't share that news from a life that is consistent with what we basically say the gospel is, is able to do, transform us into the image of Jesus, then it's, it's really going to take the power out of the gospel. We need to have a life that is consistent. How can we be salt and light if we are exactly the same as they are? If the kind of love that we have is no different than the love that the people of this world have. Jesus says we must be better and he tells us we will be better because he has made us new creatures with a new nature and new desires. As a matter of fact, the Lord says through the Apostle John in 1 John 3, 7 through 10, that the difference between us and the world because of the Spirit's dwelling within us will be so obvious that it's unmistakable. He says in that text, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Now, John there is, is pointing out generally what the difference is going to be. Those who have the Spirit of God in them are going to practice the things that Jesus tells us that we ought to do. Those who are of the devil will not practice those things, but instead they will practice sin. Now, what that means as far as our, our theme this evening is, one of those obvious differences will be that we will love our enemies as our Lord calls us to. So this evening, I want us to look at the final two points of the original five, and that is what this love should look like and how we can find the power to love in this way. Now, first of all, what should this love look like? Well, it should look like the love that the Father shows the world, as Jesus has already told us in our passage. And not surprisingly, this love will also look like the love that Jesus showed his enemies when he was in the world, since he shares the exact same nature and character as his father. Now, actually, what I'd like to do is just think about what it is that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, who all share the same character, I, I want us to look at or consider how they show mercy uh, to those who are in the world to their enemies, and how we should imitate that. But, but I just also want to note at the beginning that the, each of the three persons may do this in a different way. You know, each of the three persons of the Godhead do show love toward their enemies, but they do it differently because each of them has a different role to play, as it were, in the work of redeeming enemies or even just the common grace kind of mercy that the Lord shows the world. For instance, we read in Scripture that Jesus laid down his life for his enemies. He laid down his life for us while we were his enemies. The Father didn't do that and the Holy Spirit didn't do that. The Father is the one who gave his Son up for us, that he might make this sacrifice for us while we're his enemies. The Spirit is the one that Jesus, in laying down his life, purchased so that those who were his enemies might actually become, through the Spirit's influence, his friends. Jesus prayed for his enemies while he was on earth. We just saw an example of that. And he continues to do so from heaven. The Father is actually never said to pray the Spirit prays, but He's only said to be praying from the hearts of those who are sanctified, that is, those who belong to Him. The Spirit convicts and restrains sin in God's enemies, working through the conscience of men. 
But neither the Son nor the Father are said to do so, at least directly like the Holy Spirit does. They're all involved in the lives of their enemies. They are all showing mercy, but not in exactly the same way. But I think we should be able to find some parallels that we can draw uh, from each of them to teach us how we should love our enemies. Now, I told you at the beginning that we can perhaps divide this love or this mercy, this love of mercy, this benevolence that we are to show into two categories. What we might consider direct acts of mercy, which is what we usually think of as mercy by doing things for people, and prayer. So first of all, let's consider works of mercy. And I think that's what the Lord usually has in mind by the word benevolence. This is the kind of love that we are to show our enemies. Uh, a little bit earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this in Matthew 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, sometimes we're to show this mercy by giving to our enemies, by providing for our enemies the things they need to survive, as the Father does. I mean, we often think about showing mercy to somebody who's giving them perhaps food and clothing. Now, we saw this morning from our text that the Father loves his enemies by mercifully providing the things they need. When Jesus says in verse 45, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, what he means by that is that the Father sustains all of his creatures by giving them what is necessary to grow the food that they need to live. God is merciful. God is benevolent. He gives good to all men. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ basically did the same thing. On more than one occasion, he showed mercy to thousands of people at a time, most of whom were his enemies, by multiplying the available loaves and fish so that when he sent them away, they wouldn't faint from hunger as they returned to their homes. Now, sometimes we think because they were all sitting there nice and politely, uh, that they were the friends of the Lord Jesus, but we have to remember that they were still, as it were, under the spell of his popularity. They loved watching miracles, seeing Jesus do things, and so they continued to follow him. But in the end, they did turn against him. Now that Jesus is in heaven, he continues to show mercy by providing for the needs of all his creation. The author to the Hebrews tells us that the Lord Jesus actually keeps and again, mercifully so, because the wicked don't deserve it. He, he holds them up in existence. He's the one that keeps them from just falling into nothingness. If I can get a little um, <clears throat> philosophical here, none of us here really have an independent existence. None of us uh, can exist apart from God. He is the one who at every moment is holding us up in being. And if he wasn't, we would basically turn into nothing. Uh, we would go back into what it was we were before God actually created us. The Lord Jesus is the one who is said to uphold all things by the word of his power, and that includes even his enemies. We read in Hebrews 1, verse 3, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus is the one who is sustaining everything, holding it up in existence, moving it along, and of course, the one, as we're going to see, who also sends his Holy Spirit, who is the one who causes the sun and the rain actually to make the food grow. Maybe we think that these things just kind of work by themselves, but the Lord is at work in his creation all the time by the Spirit to make things work the way they work, what we call ordinary providence. Uh, the laws of nature are really sustained by the Holy Spirit. We read in Psalm 104, verses 27 through 30, they all wait, that is all mankind, waits for you to give them their food in due season, actually all creatures. You give to them, they gather it up. You open your hand, they are satisfied with good. You hide your face, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. 
The Holy Spirit is the one who is active in creation to make all the things that were actually made. He's also the one that is actively working in the creation to sustain it. But he's doing this, again, for his enemies. Now, we can't make the sun rise. We can't send rain, although we can give water, I suppose, in limited quantities. We can't miraculously multiply loaves and fish or cause things to grow. But we can give the things that they have provided, the, the, again, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can give the things that they have put into our care to our enemies in order to sustain them in a similar way. And that's exactly what our Lord calls us to do. Paul writes in Romans 12, verses 19 through 21, Never take your own revenge, beloved. Remember, not an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. But leave room for the wrath of God, as we read in, in our call to worship in Psalm 37. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So what should we do? But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I think by that last statement, the Lord is, is telling us that um, sometimes the Lord is going to actually use our kindness to our enemies to overcome their evil and to turn them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes he won't use it. Sometimes, you know, our showing them kindness, making them perhaps even angrier, will bring greater retribution on their heads. Now, as we looked uh, uh, last week, when we were looking at this passage where Jesus says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we do understand that sometimes the right thing to do is to take your enemy to court. And the court may rule, although perhaps not in today's courts, but may rule an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, or at least this for that, some, kind, some kind, form of justice. That's for the courtroom. But with regard to how we respond to people who injure us, we are to show mercy wherever possible leaving any retribution that is due in God's hands. We are to overcome evil with good. We are to be like the Heavenly Father, showing mercy to our enemies. Now, sometimes we're to show mercy by helping our enemy if he becomes injured. And I think here we get the classic example that uh, we see in the Good Samaritan. But first, let's understand that the Father is, and the Son and the Spirit are continually showing mercy like this towards their enemies, towards all mankind. I mean, the Father has certainly blessed his enemies with a variety of things in this world to care, or basically to cure sickness and to cure disease. It's not accidental that there are many plants in the world that actually contain uh, chemicals that, that can heal. As a matter of fact, I understand a lot of the medicines that we have today are actually from compounds that are found in plants. The Lord is the one who put those things in those plants. He was the one who also gave us the wisdom to synthesize medicines. Uh, perhaps they're not natural, but we're able to synthesize them, and we can also use those to cure and strengthen, as well as drugs that can dull or remove pain. All of those are blessings from the Lord to his enemies. The Father is the one who has given wisdom to mankind to do the various procedures that they can do in order to make us well. I mean, that's not something man came up with on his own, open heart surgery or whatever it may take to heal us. Now, we know that when Jesus was in this world, he healed many uh, to the point that he almost banished disease from Israel. Now, he did these miracles to prove who he was, that he was the Messiah. He did the things that were predicted of him but we shouldn't overlook the fact that the miracles that he chose to do, the, the things which the Father gave him to do, were things that benefited man, even, even his enemies. I mean, on one occasion, Jesus healed 10 lepers, and nine of them were Jewish, and one was a Gentile. And when they saw it, when he told them to go to the priest uh, to offer what they were supposed to offer for their cleansing, and they were cleansed on the way, only one of them turned back to give glory to God, and that was the Gentile. 
the others proved to be enemies of the Lord. So when the Lord did miracles, he didn't just raise mountains out of the ground or, or sort of command them to be cast into the sea, things that wouldn't have helped anyone. Rather, he did things that benefited his creatures. He healed them. And I think we also need to understand the Spirit is the one who makes the things that the Father has given effective to heal. He's the one that makes our bodies to heal. He's the one that guides the doctors, gives them the wisdom and the skill to heal or to repair those things that are broken. Now, again, when it comes to us, we can't create medicine. I mean, at least us as individuals. And we certainly, anybody who, who does that uh, can only basically synthesize it from materials that exist. We can't supernaturally heal anybody like Jesus healed them. We can't give anybody the skill to heal. But sometimes we can supply the things that God has provided to bring about healing. I mean, think about the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, he didn't create the oil. He didn't create the wine. He wasn't the one who gave them the power to actually bring the comfort and the health that they did bring to the injured Jew. But he could and he did bring them and apply them to the one who was injured. If our enemy is sick, we can minister to them by bringing them medicine or perhaps by bringing them food. We can show them mercy in this way. If they're in need of more significant help, we can maybe offer to take them to the doctor. If they've been in an accident, we can call for an ambulance. There are things that we can do. And the thing is, Jesus wants us to do this. He wants us to show mercy by caring for the lives and the comfort of our enemies. That's exactly what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do. Now, we can especially show them mercy by bringing the gospel to them. The Father sent his Son into the world that he might provide a way of salvation for his enemies. Remember, while we were yet his enemies, he sent Christ to die for us. The Son came that he might obey and die so that there would be a way of salvation for his enemies. The Spirit was sent to apply this salvation to those who were his enemies at the time that he applied it, as well as to be the one who would dwell in their hearts that he might change them from enemies into friends. Now that's what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have done in the work of salvation. Now. We can't do these things, and we don't need to do these things because God has already done it. But we can do what Jesus calls us to do, and that is to bring the message of what he has done to our enemies that he might lead them to salvation. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what Jesus did in the Great Commission. He's called us to go into all the nations and to preach the gospel. You know how many times... Um, Paul tried to reach out to the Jews whom he knew would be very antagonistic toward the gospel, but he continued to try to show them mercy because that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus came and he ministered to his own people and his own people turned out to hate him for it. That doesn't mean that we don't show mercy. We need to show mercy to our enemies. Now, of course, we can also show mercy to our enemies by praying for them. Jesus actually tells us to do this in verse 44 of Matthew chapter 5. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Uh, we saw that Jesus prayed for his enemies while he was on the cross, and certainly his prayers are the most effective prayers that can be offered. We read in Luke 23, 33 through 34, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, and this is praying, when you're addressing God, you're praying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus prayed. He didn't hate them. He didn't call out for vengeance, but rather he asked for mercy. Now, Paul, as I mentioned before, was constantly trying to reach out to the Jewish, uh, his Jewish brethren trying to bring the gospel to them, he also prayed for them, realizing that they were his enemies, 
from the standpoint of the gospel, but from the standpoint of God's choice of Israel, he said they were beloved for the sake of the fathers, but he prayed for them while they were yet his enemies that they might come to know Jesus and the righteousness that comes from Jesus on the basis of faith, not on the basis of their works. He writes uh, to the church at Rome in, in Romans 10, verses 1 through 4, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What Paul is essentially saying is that they're, they're going down a path that isn't going to lead to salvation. They're going to perish in that direction. And even though they have treated me in the way that they have, my desire is still that they be saved. And so I pray for them that they might come to know the Lord Jesus. Now, when somebody hates us, I mean, we know what the tendency is. The tendency is to withdraw from them. Our tendency is to hate them in return to close our hearts towards them. But I think that Sinclair Ferguson has a point here when he says that if we can bring ourselves by God's grace to pray for them, it will help us overcome the hatred that is in our hearts and help us to focus on their needs instead. I think it helps us, or as he says, to, to feel compassion when we bring them before the Lord because when we when we bring them up, as it were, before the throne room of God or before his throne, I think it also helps us to remember that day when they are going to have to stand before God in the final judgment. And certainly that can elicit pity and mercy and a desire to see them changed. If we hate somebody so much that we'd rather see them in hell, then we have a very serious problem uh, on our hands. We, we may not actually have the heart of God, uh, that new heart that he gives us in the new birth. We should never desire anyone to perish no matter what they do to us. So it helps us to feel compassion. As a matter of fact, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, that maybe it was in his mind. You know, what's going to happen to these on the day of judgment because of their hearts toward me? And he prayed for them that the Father might actually forgive them. But this is the kind of heart that Jesus calls us to have because this is the kind of heart that he has, one that perfectly reflects the heart of his Father. Again, he says in verse 48 of Matthew chapter 5, Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, again, we've, we've kind of just scratched the surface, and, but this is really all we're going to look at this evening with regard to the different ways that we can love our enemies. Uh, there's many other ways, certainly, this can be done. But perhaps we can summarize all the remaining ones by saying this, that as Jesus laid down his life to serve those who would inherit salvation while they were still his enemies, so he calls us to lay down our lives to do the same for others that they too might become his friends and no longer be his enemies. And that means, as uh, Paul tells us on one occasion, that we have to become all things to all men. Now, I did say there are two points, and the second one is very brief, so we're going to look at that now. Where are we going to find the strength to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do? And there's really only two places I think that we can find it. We can find it in the love that Jesus has put in our hearts, and we can find it in the love that he has actually shown to us. Because remember, we were in the circumstances that our enemies are in. Now, the love that he has put in, in our hearts, the presence of his Holy Spirit, the new nature, that's what gives us the power to be able to show mercy. And so let me just say this. If we want more of this power, we need to have a stronger love. And we can only strengthen that kind of love through the ways that we've looked at in the past, we need to spend more time with the Lord. Do you think it matters how much you read the Bible, how much time you spend in prayer? It, it makes a huge amount of difference. Uh, I think we would probably find if we go back and uh, were able to see how much time perhaps Whitfield or 
Wesley or uh, Edwards or certainly uh, Luther and Spurgeon, how much time they spent with the Lord in prayer, I think we, we discover that they were much with the Lord, and that's what made them much like Him. So we need to spend more time with Him in the Word and in prayer. We need to make sure that we meet together uh, for worship because we're doing the things here that the Lord has actually given to us to strengthen that love in our hearts. We need to be able to fellowship together and use what the Lord has given to us to encourage one another. We sometimes need to seek Him more intensely through fasting and prayer. But also, we need to exercise the love that the Lord actually does give to us when we, when we do gain more of it through these particular means. Every time we yield to the Spirit and do what He is moving us to do by that love, that influence grows stronger, just as it also grows weaker if we resist it. We need to exercise the love that the Lord has given to us in order for it to grow. The more we do, the more we're going to be able to do, again, purely by His grace. So that love needs to be stronger. This is exactly how it gets stronger, and it's the only way it can grow stronger. But secondly, we'll also find it by reflecting on the love that the Lord has actually shown to us. Now, everything that we've just looked at with regard to how the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have loved their enemies, we have to remember we were in the enemy category at one time. They loved us in that way when we were their enemies. But they have shown us even greater mercy by again, saving us from the consequences of our sins and giving to us this really infinitely precious future that we have with them in heaven. So we need to consider that, as, as our Lord tells us, as those who have been shown this mercy, that we need to go and show others this same kind of mercy. We need to be merciful as the Lord has been merciful to us. So may the Lord help us uh, to do that. Again, these, these are not abstract ideas, theoretical things we toss around. We've just learned something new, and now we know what this passage means. But this is really what our Lord calls us to do, and He's given us the power to do it. He's given us the command to do it. He's given us the example of how we might do it. Um, this is what we need to set our hearts to do. So may the Lord give us strength uh, to actually put these things into practice. Let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, do that.